Hi, I'm Rachel, and I'm here to talk about the BookTube Prize's Octafinals Group A list. <laughs> uh, back in January, when I first heard about the BookTube Prize, which is uh, being headed by Robert from Barter Hordes, I looked at uh, the uh, list of 48 books that started the process, and I picked out uh, 12 to read, or technically I'd already read four, and then I picked out eight more, and uh, I figured I'd read them by the octafinal groups that they were placed in, even though the prize has uh, continued to move forward. And actually, last week, Robert posted uh, the results of the octafinals in which uh, books moved on to the quarterfinals round, uh, which will take place over the next couple of months, where the judges will read and uh, whittle down the list a bit more. But I figured I'd uh, do my own thing. And so I have three books from uh, Group A, and they are The Incendiaries by R.O. Kwan and White Houses by Amy Bloom, and then The Immortalists by Chloe Benjamin, which I'd read earlier. And I would uh, talk briefly about these three books and then pick my own favorite to advance my own personal shortlist for the BookTube Prize, <laughs> even if I'm only reading a fraction of the books involved. <laughs> So I thought I'd start by talking about White Houses by Amy Bloom. I'm figuring this might be my least favorite of the three, although that is now an easy tack to take, because this is the uh, only book that has not advanced to the quarterfinals. <laughs> this is an interesting setup, uh, where the character of Lorena Hickok, or Hick, uh, is telling the story basically from one point in time throughout most of uh, the story, that uh, she's taking this long weekend with her lover, uh, former First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, after um, Eleanor became widowed. And uh, she's basically looking back on her relationship with Eleanor and also on her own formative experiences. I found parts of this uh, book to be very moving, uh, particularly the ending paragraph that I thought was just a lovely portrayal of uh, what it uh, feels like to be in love. And there were some um, passages, I think, about uh, Hick's own formative experiences of uh, her own abuse and also of uh, coming into her own as a, as a teenager, like even working at the circus a little bit. And there was also parts of this a novel that talked about uh, Eleanor's cousin who was gay himself and had, you know, issues around that that I thought really were uh, the most uh, dramatically resonant. But overall, I think it was just a little too disjointed, this whole jumping back to random parts in the past and not having a plot. Even though, as I've stated in other videos, I feel like something too narratively traditional might be too melodramatic for what is you know, actual history. If not the sexual relationship, then certainly uh, all of the players involved as uh, hugely important people. And I have to say I also did like the look into the inner lives of the Roosevelts and uh, this look at uh, Franklin Roosevelt as this sort of charismatic man who might have been a bit uh, neglectfully callous too with his own relationships. Uh, I, th I thought that was an interesting characterization. Certainly there was something very human about these characters, but overall I, I don't think I connected with them that deeply because of the narrative choices. Next I read The Incendiaries by Oro Kwan. This is another book that took a lot of liberties with traditional narrative storytelling. This is the story of uh, three Korean-American students in a university setting um, and it revolves around the issue of this uh, extremist cult that ends in an act of violence. Uh, the three characters involved are the charismatic leader of the cult, John Leal, and then one of his accolades, uh, Phoebe, and then Phoebe's boyfriend, Will. And uh, there's some interesting dancing around the issue here of religion, because Will grew up uh, in a very religious household, and then he left religion, whereas uh, Phoebe wasn't religious, but she had stuff in her own backstory, and she was sort of looking for that connection, and she uh, found it by cleaving to this cult. And then John Leal, uh, allegedly, was uh, uh, in the Gulag for a little bit in North Korea, and uh, through his experiences there, I think he learned a bit about uh, this dangerous sort of charisma that uh, a leader might be able to uh, have over his followers. 
Uh, but the story is um, told in this very unusual style. There's very little by way of descriptive uh, writing. Uh, there's not a lot of physical um, scene setting of any way. This is very much about uh, characters uh, having an internal uh, interior thoughts. Uh, particularly Will. His was the most traditional because it was just a first-person narrative account. Phoebe's was um, her saying confessionals at various times. And then uh, John Leal's were mostly just esoteric uh, thoughts about uh, religion and uh, charismatic leadership and all of that. And also another thing that uh, Quan did, which, you know, eh, makes me grind my gears a little, is that she didn't do uh, much by way of traditional um, punctuation, particularly with quotation marks, so that made it even harder to follow. And so a lot of times I really was falling out of the story, and uh, I could see why people um, identify with it so much and uh, like it so much, and there are were again some really beautiful passages and sometimes when I really got swept into the story uh, Will's boss at the restaurant really jumped off the page even if it was an asshole sort of way. And I love how uh, Quan described uh, the loss of faith and how it wasn't, you know, some sort of uh, revelation of hallelujah, I'm no longer in the Christian cult, but that Will, who uh, was uh, religious growing up, uh, felt that loss of uh, the loving kindness of God. Even though he doesn't believe in God, he feels that loss of the love that he used to feel. And that was particularly interesting for me too because uh, I come from a Jewish perspective and uh, Judaism views God and religion differently. It's not so much about a direct lovey-dovey relationship with God. So when I read about Haredi orth ultra-Orthodox Jews leaving, uh, they get caught up in uh, missing that sense of ritual that had all that importance and missing the uh, camaraderie of the community. So it was interesting to get another religious perspective. And it was interesting too to uh, get into North Korea for however little in this novel, and it made me think maybe I should uh, look more directly into North Korea and this uh, strange cult around uh, the leader there. Uh, there was, uh, and Phoebe's story was uh, quite heartbreaking too. She had uh, some trauma in her backstory that uh, she was trying to deal with. And I appreciate how Quan tried to deal with that without getting melodramatic, which I guess again can happen in a traditional narrative, but because of her writing style choices, I just couldn't connect as deeply personally. I just uh, don't think uh, I connect as deeply with uh, this experimental sort of uh, literary writing, but still I'm glad I read it. So that leaves my number one choice and what will be advancing to my personal short list doesn't really surprise me because I've been gushing about this book for months. This is The Immortalists by Chloe Benjamin. And I know my own experience with this book is probably very different than a lot of other people's. I've talked about how this was the most Jewish book that I read all year last year. <laughs> my own book club would raise their eye at me and we were a Jewish book club. <laughs> this is the story of the Gold siblings who, when they are children, uh, visit a fortune teller who tells them all privately the days that they will die and then the story breaks off into following the four siblings and seeing that through to the conclusion, uh, to put it uh, grimly, it's really much more a story about how people live their lives. And I know it's crazy, but I still kind of wish that uh, Benjamin had done away with the fortune teller that every <laughs> and uh, then we wouldn't have questions about free will versus, uh, you know, some all-seeing force. And then she could have uh, tweaked the narrative to be about the choices people make and they could be reacting to the things that happened before and choices they make in their life. But even so, most of this book, I mean, uh, the vast majority of this book, I think uh, you could ignore the fortune teller, and it really is about the choices people make and how they want to live their lives. And it's about uh, faith. I mean, uh, there was a lot more uh, Jewish expression in this book than I uh, thought there would be. Uh, direct Jewish uh, thought processes going on with the siblings and with their father. Uh, there were unreliable narrators, which to me is just a sign of reality. <laughs> <laughs> the ways that people interact with life aren't always logical. <laughs> uh, there's just a whole lot in here about uh, how we see relationships and how we see ourselves and how we try to make meaning out of life, which uh, 
which to me I think is a lot of the crux of Jewish religion. Uh, and then of course it's reinforced by the fact that there are a lot of Jewish references in this book, which is why I identified with it so much and uh, just really love it. And uh, I'm hoping it uh, continues to make it far in uh, the official book two prize. I guess I will uh, have to wait and see. You can find links to my Goodreads reviews for these three books down below. And also, I'm hoping uh, the hashtag here will lead to other uh, videos uh, about the BookTube Prize. I really loved uh, checking in with all of the judges who talked about why they chose what they chose. Keep it up, guys! <laughs> so that about covers it for me now, but I will be back soon to talk about yet another award. Uh, speaking of books of Jewish content, uh, the Jewish Book Council just announced my personal favorite award, the Sammy Rohr Prize. I've made several videos on this channel where I've uh, reviewed a lot of the books that were up for contention in the past. And um, the Sammy Rohr Prize awards emerging Jewish authors in uh, fiction and nonfiction, depending on the year. And odd years are fiction years, and so, you know, special place in my heart for that, too. <laughs> and uh, I've already read two of the books on the list, and what do you know? What cha I have a third one <laughs> out from the library anyway, which uh, I plan to read this month because it also won uh, the National Jewish Book Awards for uh, Best Fiction. So probably has a good chance of uh, <laughs> making it forward again. Although, I don't know, I really love The Weight of Ink by Rachel K. I, that's uh, the first book I've read this year and uh, easily my favorite of the year so far. But anyway, I will talk about all of that soon. I'm sure I'll make a prediction video of some sort where I gush about it. So stay tuned. <laughs> Thanks so much for watching, everyone, and I'll see you next time.